and you won't be surprised to know that I focused on Russian and Soviet art because of the language. And then life led me to Philadelphia to American Jewish History Museum, where I actually had to rediscover uh, or kind of reopen my Jewish background because I was Jewish, I moved to Israel, but it was as a Soviet Jew, uh, we have some, um, some special ways to be Jewish. So only by working at the Jewish Museum, um, I actually started to ask questions that I never asked before just by nature of being a Soviet Jew. Uh, we used to laugh with the, uh, many uh, docents that some of you are present here, the, uh, who has more hyphenation in the title, right? So I kind of beat everybody by being uh, Russian speaking, American, Israeli Jewish, uh, and all the different variations you can play around that thing. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all that, in addition to just kind of share with you why I uh, give a talk on uh, Jewish aspects uh, in American art, uh, is because uh, it's extremely personal question. Uh, wow. uh, it's extremely, um, it's, it's really a question of identity, as I hope to show in today's um, talk. So, um, as an art historian, uh, I cannot speak without images behind my back. Now, in this case, I'm going to talk with images on your screens. So I'm going to share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, now, I believe it works uh, automatically. If I share the screen, uh, you're going to see like a ribbon of faces on either left or right. I think Abby explained you can move this ribbon, but you can also um, shrink everybody and just either see me or not see me. So you have this little icons, uh, hide thumbnail video, show small active speaker video. So you can um, uh, press on that uh, and it should only show one window with me or you can even get rid of me and focus on images. So today I want to talk about Jewish dimension in American art uh, and uh, okay I just need to figure out how it works and it leads to a question is there a Jewish art that's not I'm not the first person to ask this question uh, if you google Jewish art in a Google uh, or any other research tool, uh, you'll find multiple answers. And I wanna address some of these uh, questions and answers today, but in general, uh, Jewish art, it becomes a question of really identity. I really liked um, Harold Rosenberg's uh, essay, uh, which uh, or speech actually at the opening of the Jewish Museum, uh, where he talks about um, Jewish culture and Jewish art and Jewish visual art. Uh, and uh, I like the way he uh, used uh, Jewish humor. Uh, when you have a question, is there Jewish art, you'll get two types of answers. The Gentile answer would be, yes, there is Jewish art, and no, there is no Jewish art. Uh, and then a uh, Jewish answer would be, what do you mean by Jewish art? So by being Jewish, I'm going to ask the last question, right? What do you mean by Jewish art? So let's um, take a look, and again, Google will, not just Google, but, Really, that's the source now. Um, when you Google Jewish art, you get these types of um, Jewish artistic production. And I'm focusing on visual art specifically. I'm not talking about music or literature at this point. So you get Jewish ceremonial objects and we have um, um, like variety of uh, uh, Jewish objects. I'm showing a pair of um, Torahs, Rinamons, uh, uh, by Maya Myers, uh, they are actually on view in the um, American Jewish History Museum, uh, but they belong to Mikla Israel collection. So um, no problem here. Uh, one of the early uh, silversmiths, but extremely successful, Maya Myers produced a variety of ceremonial objects, um, and you can find examples from Europe, obviously, on any other country. Another uh, type of Jewish art that you will get is art produced by Jews. And I can promise you the first artist that will show up on any search will be Mark Chagall because uh, a, he was Jewish uh, and he also used Jewish subjects, kind of legitimizing um, use of Jewish subjects in art. It was, it's questionable if it's Jewish art because Chagall was aiming for much more universal ideas and Jews um, appear in his paintings uh, but it's not really a, about Jewish experience or Jewish topics uh, most of the time. You will also have just Jewish subjects in art. Predominantly, they'll be painted by Jewish artists. 
uh, and they will appear roughly in um, since early um, sorry mid 19th century and then definitely will appear in early 20th century because by that time you had market for this kind of genre paintings uh, Jews were purchasing art by that time and Jews were producing art by that time so you will have a uh, depiction of uh, rabbis or, or Shabbos or synagogue scenes or Jewish uh, market street uh, market scenes um, of different um, of different styles even so um, so what 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 are we going to do now what is Jewish art right uh, if we're going to look at history of um, when we get into this point of uh, mentioning Jewish art other than ceremonial objects or genre scenes. Um, you will probably uh, discover that Moritz Daniel Oppenheim was uh, often mentioned in literature as the first Jewish painter of the modern era. Um, now, whenever you deal with the question of the first, uh, it's problematic, uh, but um, let's, let's see why he is in especially in early scholarly literature is mentioned as the first Jewish modern painter. The answer is very simple. He was born Orthodox Jew and he practiced throughout his career. He worked with uh, Jewish uh, patrons, non-Jewish patrons, but he was um, able to preserve his Jewishness and his religion and he was openly uh, practicing it. So uh, that, I guess, uh, gives that um, ability for scholars of Jewish art to say here we have the first Jewish painter because he remained Jewish. He didn't baptize, he didn't really change his uh, uh, or kind of conceal his Jewish identity, which many painters had to do just to find market, uh, just to be able to, um, to sell their work. Now, uh, this particular work is interesting uh, is because he is treating also Jewish themes. So we have a combination of two aspects. He is Jewish and he's also painting Jewish subject. Here we have a Jewish volunteer returning uh, to his family, living uh, according to customs, according to tradition. And it's kind of interesting how compositionally he separates the sphere, right? We have the um, soldier uh, sitting on the left next to the door. He is even kind of looking towards the door, the outside. And then you have the inner world uh, signified by the Kaddish cup right at the center of the composition on the table there and the hollow. So it's like little uh, Shabbos still life there. And then the mother is standing uh, on the other side um, of the uh, Kiddush cup. So again, kind of signifying the domestic and um, she looks kind of um, uh, strange on her son, not really embracing him, uh, folding her hands. So it's a little um, like, or even you can sense that she's a little unhappy with his him being so outside. While the father is embracing him, uh, we have the theme of this prodigal uh, son and, and like so many references just in one painting, but it's also an excuse to paint some of the Jewish interior and for uh, some scholars it serves as kind of this ability to see, uh, to see inside the Jewish home at that time. Uh, my personal favorite is the vicious cat who is a uh, kind of symbol of vice and temptation who is sitting uh, on the right of the Kiddush cup on the floor there, um, also kind of you know, looking unhappy with the summer home. So um, Oppenheim signifies this um, beginning of enlightenment, beginning of assimilation of Jews into mainstream art. As I said, he painted portraits for um, Christian or non-Jewish uh, patrons, uh, was making was able to make a living this way, but he treated Jewish subjects as well and uh, remained Jewish. He taught art, uh, which is also a big deal because that's uh, when Jews enter the universities and it happens across uh, different fields, but we are interested in, uh, in visual arts. Now that happens in Germany. Uh, let's see what's going on in America. In America, we also have our first, um, first American born Jewish artist to receive international acclaim. I want to be careful the, with the first here uh, because we're not trying to be essentialist, but it sounds good, right? First American born Jewish uh, artist. Now the little issue here is that um, he left uh, America as many American artists and most of his life he spent uh, in Rome. Uh, and yet uh, he was connected. And of course, this sculpture, uh, which stands by the Jewish Museum now, um, 
was commissioned by Bnei Brit and uh, signifies very universal subject of liberty or religious liberty. But of course, it was extremely important for Jewish Americans at the time. Religious liberty was um, a freedom that they gained in America uh, versus many other places at that time. Uh, what's interesting is that Ezekiel received his education in military institute, and that tells us that to be artist as a profession was not the most popular thing in Jewish community. For same reasons, it uh, continues to be uh, not too popular because of the practical aspect of it. You cannot really make a living. That's where I'm supposed to say it with kind of Eastern European accent, but I decided not to. Uh, so yes, it wasn't practical. Uh, Jews uh, were uh, trying to establish themselves on economic uh, scene in America and art was not uh, offering really uh, an employment uh, or money-making ability. So uh, we have early artists receiving their education in military institute institutions because they were trained to be surveillors or uh, they were trained to depict um, uh, scenery. It's interesting that an exhibition that just uh, ended uh, at PAFA uh, dedicated to early American landscape, uh, the earliest American landscape um, uh, were actually produced by military surveyors. So uh, it's an interesting connection here. Um, now, he served on the uh, Confederate side of the American Civil War and after war was ended, he left and uh, moved to uh, Europe and that's why he continued his education. Uh, eventually moved to Rome and stayed uh, there. Uh, so we are in the second part of the, 90, of the 19th century. And uh, what, uh, so we, we, we have our American artist who is, as we said, uh, received international acclaim, trained academically, academic uh, sculptor in this case. He would not become a sculptor in early times by the nature of the trade. I want to mention briefly the second commandment because it's also known that in Jewish religion, uh, second commandment um, kind of um, forbids to produce sculptured um, sculptures uh, and uh, other images, uh, the likeness of the human being. Uh, we should remember that um, it's interpreted in different ways uh, and Jewish art existed from early times. Uh, we have Jewish uh, synagogues with paintings uh, of uh, biblical scenes uh, from six centuries and uh, um, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it, it was practiced. Jewish representational imagery existed. It was not mainstream. It was not as popular as in Christian culture, partially for the reason that um, uh, Christians had to use imagery to uh, explain the new religion, to show it to uh, populations that didn't necessarily read uh, uh, Bible or were familiar with the narrative. Jews didn't have to deal with that, so the tradition wasn't born. Nevertheless, um, just to move on from uh, Ezekiel and sculpture, which proves that uh, when we get into more secular society, Jews start to practice uh, without any problems. Uh, Albert Rosenthal uh, is uh, an artist that I actually discovered in Pafa's collection, because when I was working on this talk, my, I wanted to connect it with uh, Pafa. Um, so, so far I showed you an artist from Germany, uh, an artist from the South, uh, the uh, Jewish artists, uh, with, I'm talking about Ezekiel, with Sephardic background and kind of serving on Confederate side and living America. Uh, not all American artists, even though it was a little trend, lived abroad. So Rothenthal represents the uh, artist who uh, received his education already at Papa. His father was actually a professor at Papa, Max Rothenthal, and um, he was the engraver. That was the artistic trade that Jews would practice a lot because engraving was practical. Engraving was a profession where you could produce images and uh, make a living. So uh, it was considered kind of technical trade. So uh, it was more popular for families to approve their sons in this point uh, to become engravers. But then the second generation who already grows up with father engraver get an opportunity to receive academic uh, education in art. So uh, Rodenthal technically studied at PAFA. It looks like uh, he was mostly trained by his father. Uh, eventually he also goes abroad and studies uh, with the 
um, none other is uh, uh, Jerome, the student of Jacques-Louis David. So he gets really, really uh, proper academic training and he comes back to Papa, um, sorry, he comes back to Philadelphia. Eventually he settles in Bucks County um, and uh, lives through the mid of the 20th century practicing um, really multiple uh, trades. He was engraver, he um, created uh, paintings, and he was lithographer and editor. So uh, really uh, diverse kind of artistic uh, trades there. Um, now, he grows in status to the level that he's commissioned to paint portraits of Supreme Court justices and uh, becomes extremely established and really uh, famous uh, American artist. Uh, but his Jewishness is, uh, he's buried in Jewish cemetery, his father is buried in Jewish cemetery. I couldn't find much of biographic information, so I don't know to what degree they practice uh, worthy members of synagogues, that's probably still to be discovered, but uh, he was um, Jewish, he did not convert in any uh, way. So can we talk about Rottenthal as Jewish artist who got acceptance in American mainstream? He is a, a member of Academy, he is, uh, painting Supreme Court justices. Um, uh, that's uh, an open-ended question. My answer would be yes, uh, because not everybody gets his um, birthday uh, mentioned in Philadelphia Inquirer from 1920 with a portrait, and uh, it's uh, dedicated to, um, you know, kind of distinguished artists. So he's uh, uh, acknowledged as a distinguished artist. Uh, this is how he made his living. The portraits, uh, and I can show you many, many more, they also were engraved. Uh, and they were typical academic portraits uh, with the, executed with a great skill. Um, now, so is that the answer? We have Jewish artist who is academically trained uh, and uh, who is making a living by producing portraits. He lives in America, so he's American, he's Jewish, that's fine. So is that what we would... Uh, defined as Jewish art, practical, uh, allowing to earn uh, and, and kind of developing American culture without uh, negating Jewish background. So academician, maybe, but then, uh, oh, sorry, before I go to the then, um, he is uh, visually depicting America happening at that time. Uh, Charles Knox Smith commissions his portrait for Vudimir Art Museum, um, uh, not open, open, the museum opened a few years before the portrait was made, but he wants to uh, show himself as this museum uh, establisher uh, and to depict his portrait and he commissions Rodenthal. So it, it, he could commission any other artist, he picks Rodenthal. I cannot not throw back at Charles uh, Peel's portrait uh, and his museum uh, because obviously we have this clear connection there and Rothenthal who studies at Puffa definitely sees uh, the portrait uh, by Peel. Um, so this is new American uh, uh, patron of art uh, and Rothenthal is the one who documents uh, that patronage. And yet he also depicts portraits of this kind, uh, some of them kind of edging on uh, almost impressionism. Uh, or symbolism. Uh, so he's not limited to this academically kind of stiff uh, portraiture style. He depicts uh, women in different settings and different um, color schemes. And okay, we can say that me, I don't know the identities of these women. Uh, the portrait on the left uh, was presented on uh, Buffa's annual exhibition in, and it just as millinery. Uh, the woman on the, uh, the green, uh, uh, woman in green uh, is called jade uh, beads so it's not even again identified as a portrait uh, but it's more kind of green on green so we can see artistic ambition to play with colors and explore expressive possibilities of colors um, and also he depicts things like that uh, now those are found on online auctions uh, they don't even have the date they identified uh, by artist signatures there so he's not limiting himself to any specific genre. Um, still life, here you go. Uh, something very domestic. I don't know who is that woman. I don't want to speculate if that's his grandmother or not, but she is a grandmother. She looks like mine. Um, so he, he is able to kind of capture the humanity and in, in very 
uh, light um, uh, style as well. So we have Rosenthal, uh, highly trained artist, highly established artist uh, with uh, really national reputation, uh, not limiting himself to any of the particular uh, subjects or, or um, definitions of academic um, genres. Now, so we can say that uh, by early 20th century, American Jewish artists have a choice uh, and many of them who choose to become professional artists are able to find um, income and able to find um, you know, professional uh, fulfillment um, in different ways. And then of course we get to the 20th century with the influx of um, immigrants from Eastern Europe among them uh, 2 million Jews, which is only 10% uh, of the general um, uh, immigrant uh, arriving, but uh, obviously they concentrate on Lower East Side and that gives the impression that uh, New York now is completely Jewish. Now, um, if you are not familiar with the um, different ways of immigration to America, I can't believe that I'm plugging in for Jewish Museum here, you have to visit that museum because uh, it really tells the story of uh, establishment of different ways of immigration and how, how each new immigration was um, annoying the previous immigration wave and it, like the Sephardic Jews consider themselves the better Jews than Germans who came in mid 19th century and then Germans looked down at Eastern European Jews uh, and then when we get to the uh, 20th century uh, nobody knew what to do with Soviet Jews because they not almost Jews, right? Like, what, what is that coming now? Um, so with the Jews coming from Eastern Europe, uh, German American Jews had to deal with identity question because they considered their culture to be the proper, the right Jewish culture. And here you have two million people who come and practice and uh, look different and uh, their traditions are different. Um, now, many artists um, came I'm sorry, many, um, many artists who came from Russia um, kind of were self-taught or they were exposed to, depend on the year, but they were exposed to some uh, uh, traditional uh, training uh, through, again, fathers or teachers that they happened to meet because it was extremely untypical for Jews to be trained in art in, in Russia. Forget about Russia. They could get some training in Germany or in Baltic countries, but not really in Russia. That was not something that Jewish boy, forget about girls, will do. Uh, so if you have Jewish artists coming from Russia, that would be against uh, the rule. Uh, it was, again, just not a tradition and there were multiple complications that um, uh, created the situation like that. So Jacob Epstein uh, depicting Hester Street crowd, and he would become the famous Cubist uh, sculptor. Um, he's depicting something that surrounds him. Um, I don't think it's an accident uh, that uh, on the foreground he has very distinctly uh, a Jewish men. Uh, I think it's a choice. But when Epstein was asked about, uh, are you Jewish artist, are you American artist? He made a very long kind of talk um, in several sentences where he literally said, I'm American artist, but I'm also a Jew. That makes me Jewish artist, but I'm an American artist. And like back and forth, back and forth, really showing how he struggled with this aspect of his identity. Now it's significant that he ended on saying, but I'm an American artist. Um, so uh, uh, it became the trademark for Jews who wanted to, uh, um, to become uh, integrated uh, into American culture, uh, their American, to be, to be American was an extremely uh, important aspect uh, of their identity. So uh, some of them completely downplayed their Jewishness, even kind of rejecting it. Uh, and uh, others uh, baptized or, you know, did uh, kind of convert it, uh, but uh, many just abandoned religion and tradition uh, to, um, just to kind of not to be forced to ask this question, do I have to stay religious? Do I have to change religion? They just abandoned religion altogether. Um, now, why I'm bringing up this context, because uh, I wanted to, again, kind of when I was uh, looking for Jewish artists in Papa's collection, uh, 
I came across, uh, we don't really have that many artists from that background in the collection. Uh, partially because of the uh, history of Paphos collecting, um, but there are not that many artists who depicted, uh, you know, kind of social aspect of living on the uh, Lower East Side uh, or dedicated their uh, art to exploring Jewish uh, subjects in any way, um, unless I didn't discover them yet. But we do have uh, very interesting uh, connections with the um, new wave of immigration and what was going on on the Lower East Side. Uh, this connection is the Art Students League. Uh, that was the institution uh, which opened doors to become visual artists to many, many uh, men and women, among them many, many uh, Jewish uh, men and women. Um, because again, there was no tradition of Jewish education in visual art and Art Student League offered that um, door, opened that door for them. So, um, majority of social uh, oriented artists uh, that uh, you're familiar with, uh, in some way are connected with art student leagues, uh, league. But what I found interesting is that this woman um, who, uh, according to one historian, uh, was the second, George uh, second to George O'Keefe of best known women artists in New York, um, extremely um, important salon uh, was uh, run in her house with her sisters. Uh, so Florence Stadheimer, Jewish background, studied in Art Student League. Now, um, we're going to talk about Stadheimer, uh, but I kind of want to emphasize this connection because uh, something that uh, created a lot of artists socially aware and creating socialist realist art or sorry social realist art not to confuse with socialist realist art uh, come from artist student league uh, because of their background and living in lower east side and their awareness of difficulties and uh, the situation with the immigrant life uh, at that time Stadheimer is coming from a very different background she is born into very wealthy New York family. She's German, um, American German Jewish artist. Uh, and her mother through intermarriages connected with um, Seligmans, Hellmans, Guggenheims. Again, uh, if you, uh, when you visit Jewish Museum, look at the family tree uh, on the fourth floor. Um, and uh, these are the families that kind of originate from uh, early, um, uh, early settlers and also of the early German immigration uh, to America. So um, Florine grows up in the most um, privileged, um, most um, educated uh, background. Now what's interesting is the her particular family was father abandoned them and she grew up with her mother and her sisters. She never marries, Three, two of her sisters also never marry. Uh, they go, but they have money. Uh, let's put it uh, simple, through inheritance and investments. They have money, they're able to live in Europe part-time, they live in the uh, Upper East Side uh, in New York. Um, so um, she has access uh, to most uh, prestigious um, houses and she's familiar with people who kind of um, the cream of the cream of society at that time. Now, after, uh, when the World War I started, her family returns to New York and she, uh, establishes uh, this so-called salon in her apartment. Uh, if you're interested in the subject, uh, Jewish Museum held an um, exhibition on Jewish women uh, in, the, in their salons. Um, that's the yellow book. Um, and uh, you can learn about other uh, Jewish women. And it's, it's kind of interesting because um, the tradition of salons started in the 17th century France. Uh, so the exhibition talks about kind of uh, interesting aspect of women as uh, promoters of certain ideas and um, different styles in art and different art groups, but also Jewish women uh, have additional layer of being uh, kind of outsider within the outsider world. But that's another topic, another conversation. Um, Stadheimer uh, opens her doors to um, something that uh, we would call the, the future you know, avant-garde groups, right? She comes back during World War I uh, and in her 
house, um, she hosts uh, other avant-garde artists who also escape World War I and find themselves in America. Now, um, I'm not fond of going list by list and checking who is Jewish, who is not. I'm sure um, most of you will be able to know just because you know Jewish history. Uh, but um, we can, I don't think, again, it's a coincidence that majority of people or many people who come to her uh, house are Jewish. She's Jewish. She never denied her Judaism. In fact, uh, there is a um, writing in her diary where she uh, talks about how she took pleasure of, uh, of telling one woman on the train who asked her if she's uh, Christian. She said, no, I'm not Christian. I'm, in fact, I'm Jewish. So she emphasized her Jewishness. And yet she didn't practice. It looked like her, uh, that's the portrait of her with her sisters and her mother. Um, they didn't practice. Uh, they, uh, she was extremely uh, contemporary woman. Uh, she positioned herself as this kind of new woman, independent with education um, and really uh, distancing herself from Jewish religion or Jewish traditional home. Uh, and yet he, uh, she never uh, concealed her Jewishness. He emphasized it on this occasion on the train. And people who came to her house were Jewish. Um, religious or not, probably not, uh, but that constituted her uh, surrounding. So when she paints her uh, self-portrait, uh, and look at the size of the picture, it's really, really large scale painting. Of course, she is playing uh, on uh, Manes Olympia, and it's, as far as I understand, is the first nude uh, self-portrait. So she paints that before the following portrait by other artists. Another uh, contemporaneous is uh, um, Madison Becker's uh, portrait, but it's, it's a different, um, uh, different portrait. Um, so anyway, she, point, she paints herself, uh, harking back to Monet, um, and um, I mean, with all due respect, it's hard to expect from traditional Jewish woman to paint herself in nude in such a kind of provocative uh, way. So uh, we can, I, and yet, I don't know, it's kind of, it's the provocation of it uh, in the context of uh, Stadheimer makes her Jewish by denial. Um, I don't know if you will agree with this term. Now, um, in the, one of her paintings, uh, so a rare studio party, uh, she actually places this portrait in the context of her guests. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with, uh, with her art, um, since she didn't really uh, have to sell, she didn't have to make a living by selling her art, she was able to paint for herself. But we know painters, artists never do that for themselves, right? So like it's always intended uh, as a dialogue with the public. She just didn't uh, have to find commercial uh, uh, application for her work. So she depicted intimate subjects. She depicted the evenings in her house, uh, picnics, uh, guests coming, portraits of her sisters, first portraits of her guests. So in this one, um, I love this painting because it's kind of um, uh, making, uh, making fun or making a joke on art uh, salons of, of, her, of her own art salon. Um, if you look carefully on the right foreground, there is an Arlequin pants. So Comedia de la Art, uh, she's kind of ins inserting the Arlequin in the painting. These individuals are identified. Um, and so those are, uh, you know, wives and uh, artists themselves and critics. Leo Stein uh, is standing, is sitting actually in the, uh, at the center. Um, the man who conveniently covers uh, her private parts uh, is the poor uh, artist um, from uh, India. Uh, now poor, not because he's poor, but because he feels extremely uncomfortable in this uh, situation. And uh, it looks like nobody except for a woman with a purple hat is looking at the painting. So they, the painting is there, it's right in the middle, uh, but everybody prefers to look at something else. Uh, it looks like uh, she realized that she provokes, she realizes that um, people are going to kind of feel uncomfortable and she loves this aspect uh, in her work. So she really, uh, not only she depicts, she paints the painting, but she also paints the painting within the painting uh, to reflect on how uh, people respond um, to that. 
Um, now, uh, the list of uh, names that you hopefully see on your screen, those are uh, people who visited her salon regularly. And again, as I said, um, many of them are Jewish. Uh, as I, I read her biography and I looked at the index and I was trying to find the word uh, Jewish in that biography. The whole book, quite thick book, mentioned it maybe once or twice. Uh, so it, it really doesn't, like we, we talk about Jewish art as art created by Jews. She definitely is as Jewish as it gets in terms of her upbringing and connections. And yet uh, I couldn't think of uh, anyone less uh, Jewish in this uh, uh, regards. So uh, Stockheimer complicates uh, this idea of um, Jewish art, similar to Rosenthal, right? We didn't really find any specifically Jewish subjects in Rosenthal's work. Will we consider that Jewish art? Uh, I guess we'll have to borrow uh, the quote and say yes and no. And I'm happy to have this conversation if anyone wants to share their opinion at the end of the talk. Uh, please do. I'm going to speed up through because um, there are, I want to get to two more artists. Uh, this painting is in Pafa's collection and I briefly mentioned it just uh, so you'll remember that it's there and visit it as soon as the museum reopens. Uh, it's a picnic uh, and she depicts people who are at that picnic uh, and um, the lobster on the blanket. Uh, I think it's another kind of way of uh, um, really emphasize in the cosmopolitan and not rule following uh, aspects of her life. Now, uh, another upper uh, east side German Jew is Helen Frankenthaler, uh, who is the daughter of a uh, Supreme Court judge, talking about, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning it to emphasize the status of Jews in American society by that time. Now, uh, Frankenthaler, um, did not go to artist uh, art league um, to study. She studied in um, uh, other college and she wanted to become an artist and she was able uh, to uh, get this uh, education right away. Uh, her family was progressive cultural uh, Jewish family and they wanted their daughters to get education and get professional careers. In the 50s, she met Clement Greenberg, uh, one of the foremost critics of the day, Jewish. Uh, but um, basically she enters the uh, abstract expressionist um, circle uh, and um, she also studied with Hans Hofmann, a uh, German formalist uh, artist. So she really uh, falls into um, uh, the circle of artists who explore abstraction as the language uh, to express ideas, but also in her case, um, uh, the formal aspect of abstract art. Now, I assume everybody knows that Frankenthaler uh, developed this kind of special technique of using extremely diluted paint and kind of penetrating her uh, canvases with diluted paint, creating very interesting visual effects. Um, her exhibition is on you at PAFA uh, as, as we speak and we'll stay there for a while so you'll be able to see some of her works. Um, but what interests me is really um, being a the same idea that I am um, trying to discuss in this talk. So she is Jewish, she has Jewish upbringing, um, and she's connected with the Jewish environment. Now, abstract art uh, was uh, often uh, discussed as inherently Jewish in subject because of uh, abstract quality of Jewish religion. Uh, there are essays on abstract expressionist in Kabbalah, um, Kabbalah. Um, now, these two uh, Jewish abstract expressionist artists uh, often studied in terms of uh, connection with Judaism, um, uh, Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko, uh, and the idea of sublime, idea of uh, this kind of uh, eternal feeling that we get from uh, abstract art uh, resonates uh, with uh, Jewish philosophy. So there was a uh, trend in uh, scholarship of abstract expression in, written by um, critics who had Jewish background to kind of find uh, the connection between uh, uh, Judaism and uh, abstract expressionism. Now, um, 
uh, Leo Steinberg, for example, um, saw it as reconciliation, as kind of renunciation of um, figurative art, of the social, um, not social, of the kind of nationalist aspects of figurative art. Let's not forget that this whole thing happens after the war, during the Cold War, and realist art now is strongly associated with Soviet socialist realism. So abstract, uh, abstraction is hailed as this kind of American art of freedom, art of um, mind um, and spirituality. So Frankenthaler, being the second generation of the artist, doesn't really signs up for, for this whole thing about um, sublime and um, philosophy and abstraction as the expression of uh, higher values of humanity. Um, in fact, she, when she painted this work, um, uh, she mentioned um, that um, she, um, that when she painted that she was filled with ideas about landscape, space, arrangement, perspective, repetition, flatness, all formalist, right? Uh, but she is often forced, uh, was forced to associate her work with something. Um, so she said, well, after I painted that, I saw a ladder, I thought about landscape, so here you go, it's uh, Jacob's um, letter. So she named the work kind of following the push uh, from her critics, I guess, uh, to associate it with somehow, to give some, some interpretation to the work. And she picks the idea of Jacob's uh, letter, which is biblical, uh, which is from Old Testament. Uh, so are we happy to say here we have Jewish artists also painting Jewish subjects. I personally don't think so because a any subject from Old Testament was uh, totally fine to paint for Christian painters since it's also a Christian subject uh, in terms of uh, religious connection, um, and also because uh, let's face it, she called she wasn't thinking about Jacob's letter when she painted. She assigned the title uh, by uh, association and. Uh, you can see the letter kind of formally appearing um, at the center if you try really hard. I, I didn't see the letter really uh, for a very long time as I looked at this painting. So uh, Frankenthaler uh, creates a situation for us when it's tempting to fit her art uh, into uh, Jewish uh, uh, art because of her being Jewish and her subject being abstract. Uh, but um, it's, she really denies us that comfort uh, because it's clearly that the subject matter is secondary for her. Is it Jewish art because she is Jewish? I really have a hard time to accept that premise. But on the other hand, uh, you cannot deny that being Jewish art because she's uh, Jewish. Now, to make uh, matters even more complicated, uh, I'm going to show you one more artist that I, uh, I, I hope somebody knows because I actually discovered it too when I was working on that uh, talk. Uh, and his name is Harvey Dinerstein. We have a living artist that I'm talking for a change. I know his, uh, I think his brother is actually in Philadelphia and there I saw some exhibition, uh, I can't remember his uh, name. I mean, it's Dinerstein, but the different first name. So Harvey Dinerstein is in Brooklyn and he is born in the same year as Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, and he is um, coming, uh, to age as an artist in the midst of abstract expressionism, which was quite militant against uh, figurative, figurative art. So Dinerstein is, uh, he, he belongs to the group of artists who kind of fights abstract expressionism and wants to preserve the uh, tradition of figurative art. Now, he is very Jewish. Finally, we have an artist who is uh, talking about his Jewishness, depicts Jewish subjects, I'll show you, not, very, not, not as simple as I just said it, but he also fits into Jewish history narrative because um, he goes uh, to Montgomery County to depict uh, the events of civil rights movement uh, as a journalist, but also he uh, later on uses it as, in his art. He goes uh, uh, there uh, as many uh, young Jewish men and women went to help with the, I mean, he doesn't really participate in the protest. He depicts them or kind of captures their, um, uh, these events. But um, this idea of um, helping others, tikkun um, olam, uh, resonate with uh, lots of um, American Jews in, in the mid of the 20th century. So he participates in, in that uh, movement. Uh, now, he also paints um, 
really large scale paintings in very figurative uh, academic style or realist style um, and uh, makes a point of preserving the uh, this uh, tradition. Now I remind you, he, this one is from the 60s, so this is the peak of abstract expression is where the figurative painter was um, almost like uh, a scene because you're either socialist, socialist and you paint realistic paintings so you kind of work with the Soviets uh, or you just uh, kind of retrograde and not progressive um, and uh, exhibitions of realist art that Dinerstein tried to, to uh, they, they had exhibition of realist art uh, which basically went unnoticed. Um, now, when I was in school and I studied uh, art history of the period, uh, I came out with the expression that figurative art died in America, there, and it only was resurrected later on with, uh, uh, like in the 70s, as a rejection of abstract expressionism. Um, now, ta-da, it did not die. So here we have very bad reproduction, because ironically, Dinerstein, who... Um, uh, is, I guess, <laughs> I don't want to say that, but uh, he is represented in many museums. He is represented at PAFA, but his painting is not in our online connection. And I wasn't able to get the picture because of the quarantine. So the only painting that we have at PAFA is uh, a portrait of Noah Wolf, who was his favorite Jewish uh, model. Now, I don't have an image to show. That will be a follow-up conversation. Uh, so I had to use images from the web, and on the web uh, you get really this kind of uh, um, reproductions. Uh, he's selling his works in auctions, uh, but it's, it's kind of hard to find a decent reproduction of his work. I wanted to use this particular painting because uh, it's a, a scene of a Jewish dinner, and when he talks about this painting, he said that he wanted to kind of combine in one work the memories of his childhood. Anyone? Well, you cannot answer me right now, but um, think, what do you think is represented? What kind of Jewish dinner that is? Um, and if you look at the children section, if you look at the little girl, she's dressed up as a princess. Uh, so it's a Purim uh, dinner. Uh, it's, uh, she's dressed up as a, uh, a stair. Now, um, if you look at the uh, table set up, you have a man at the center. He recalls how his uncle used to uh, tell the, 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 the story of Purim. Uh, other people are either relatives or uh, people who he remembers from his childhood. Notice how women are separated and sitting on one side, men on the other side. So it's kind of, uh, I guess, serves the purpose. It's a Jewish dinner. I have hard time to imagine Jewish dinner like that with hala glass of wine and fish on the table. Uh, and I made a test. I showed this painting to my colleagues who are not Jewish. Um, if they are able to kind of what what associations they get when they see this painting. So when you have wine, fish, and a bunch of men sitting behind the table, um, uh, nod if you had a similar association. But you cannot not to think about the Last Supper, right? Um, so is he making a reference to Last Supper? I don't know. I didn't read about it. But I think the, uh, the epic aspect of the Last Supper, of the kind of gathering, um, uh, maybe uh, that's what he wanted uh, to, to show. And I'm also tempted, I cannot resist, to show you the latest reiteration of the Last Supper, which is super uh, relevant for our conversation today. Have you seen that online? The new Last Supper, the video conference, Last Supper. So they all on Zoom now, <laughs> just like we are. Uh, I don't know if you're on Facebook, but if you, uh, if you are, I'm sure it's, uh, it appears in other places. Uh, the web goes insane with uh, uh, different alterations of artworks to reflect the pandemic and the quarantine situation. But that's not the topic of our conversation. Let's go back to Dinerstein uh, as we complete our talk today. Um, he paints um, kind of universal aspect of humanity. His favorite subject is the New York subway. And in this particular work, which again, is very large scale, it's from 1996, uh, but it's, it's kind of typical. He, he paints other paintings, but they share the aspect of uh, 
closed um, space, such as a train car or street corner or apartment, and there you have different uh, representatives uh, of humanity or of community uh, in kind of, on one hand, very natural way, because that's how New York subway looks like in rush hour, but also in very superficial artistic way. Uh, and you will always, or most of the time, you will find a Jewish boy or a Jewish old man in the picture. Here, our Jewish boy with kippah is looking at the window, and he also puts himself in the picture. The artist is sketching um, uh, as he stands by the door. Now, um, stylistically is kind of connecting us with Rosenthal with high academic training, uh, uh, meticulous uh, brush stroke, uh, really, really great handling of light and composition and facial expression. I mean, I can go on and on. Um, and, uh, and yet it's as contemporary as, as it gets. So Dinerstein, um, and frankly, when I was working on the talk, it's almost by accident that I ended up with two men and two women. And then two men are kind of tying it to academic tradition and realistic tradition and training and importance of training uh, and also the idea of kind of universality uh, of humanity. And then two women that direct opposites where, um, um, where Frankenthaler is uh, embracing abstract expressionism uh, she, she's a second generation of popular expression, so she's exploring the formal uh, aspect uh, of art. Um, and then uh, Stadheimer is allowing herself to be, to practice very individual style. Somebody called her Jewish Rococo. Um, so she's kind of whimsical, uh, figurative, and also abstract to a certain degree. Uh, so, but just really practicing, um, just really creating um, as a way to express herself or express her perception of reality. So they all express perception of reality. They all uh, use art as kind of universal conversational pieces, and yet they are so extremely very different. So here is the culminating style that uh, uh, kind of to finish our conversation uh, and open it for questions. If we still have time, Abby will tell us. Uh, I just want to. Um, share my personal thought after this uh, run through uh, just a few Jewish artists, we could pick others, uh, is that Jewish art will be defined differently by different people. It can mean different things to different people. Uh, and I leaving this talk with, no, I don't have an answer what constitutes Jewish art, but I do have a feeling that um, it really is not that important. And just as with any idea, any attempt to kind of uh, create uh, definitions, they fail the moment you start to look at individual artists. So there is some universality in art historical concepts, but uh, we cannot really just take them as universal concepts. You have to look at individuals um, as they create. And if we find any shared traits, Fine. If we don't, that will also confirm that art is individual thing and um, it means individual things for the observer as well as for the artist. Well, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, yeah, if you want to stop sharing, we have actually gone over our time, but we can go a few more minutes if we would like some questions. I want to make sure we always have time for that. So if people want, here's to raise their hand virtually, we will call on you. So you go down to the participant button and then you should be able to see where you raise your hand or you can put questions in the comments and I will read them out loud to Katerina. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I'm not missing anybody, but we do just have a minute or two. So if you'd like to raise your hand, do so now. All right, I see one, Marissa. You were the first hand I saw. I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, um, wonderful lecture, thank you so much. Um, but I have a question about as far as identifying as a Jewish artist versus the country you're from. What would be the advantage or what would be the reason to do that in light of um, the way that of the prejudices and et cetera, anti-Semitism? What would be the benefit or what would be the reason to identify as a Jewish artist 
versus an American artist. That's it. Um, do you mean now uh, or historically? Uh, either. Uh -huh. So um, hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't know about benefits. We can talk about benefits. Um, there is a there is a need to identify ethnically. I think just um, when you navigate identities, uh, when you say, okay, let me rephrase it. When I'm asked where I'm from, and I answer from, from New York, I get, no, but where are you from? Then I say, I'm from Israel. No, no, but your accent is not Israeli. So I have to say that I'm from Russia, but I'm not Russian. So the reason why I'm bringing that all up, sometimes people are not so much identified by how they identify themselves, but by how they identify to others. And Jews notoriously identified by being Jewish, like you are Jewish even if you don't start your conversation, hi, I'm Katerina, I'm Jewish. Uh, but somehow Jewish identity is kind of highlighted uh, in the conversation. Um, so for artists to identify Jewishly probably would come when they are asked uh, or, or a certain identity question. It's also to find a community um, or to kind of to belong somewhere. Uh, it could be also pragmatic in my opinion, like if you uh, identify as Jewish artists, you probably will have access to Jewish patrons so for people who are interested in Jewish art. Um, so they're, they're, I'm, I'm not sure I like the word benefit, but... Um, there are different reasons why people would identify as Jewish artists. Gotcha. Um, Thank you. So we had another hand, but I think it went down. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question about Oppenheim in the chat from RJ asking, what about Oppenheim allowed him to practice as an artist and be accepted as a Jewish artist? Um, so uh, Oppenheim comes in the period uh, of um, uh, enlightenment, uh, especially in Germany. Uh, when there was this moment when uh, Jews were allowed to go to universities and kind of enter the mainstream. Uh, and he benefits from um, the later part of that um, um, accessibility uh, because there was a moment uh, in Europe and in Germany in particular when um, Jews were accepted with, with the limitations, with the certain bots, but uh, they were accepted. Um, and in the part of Jewish uh, history is that's when, that, that's when the assimilation actually started to take place. And many people choose to assimilate and kind of abandon Jewish practice. And many people did not. They continued. This is when the hyphenated German Jews uh, come into place. So they would be, continue to be Jewish, but also would be German. But it was extremely hard to maintain Jewish identity and Jewish practice in this environment, even though it was more accepted than before. So Oppenheim is an exception, or at least um, he hi he is highlighted because he insisted on uh, preserving his Jewishness, which made his life more difficult for sure. I'm not sure. Did I answer the question? Yeah, and I think we've got one more hand um, from Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm going to lower. I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Go ahead. Katerina, you know I always have to say something, right? <laughs> I was waiting for it. Hi, Phil. It's so good to see you. Now, I really was intrigued, um, you know, because I've done a lot of study about Judaism and a lot of study about art, and I never really heard that abstract expressionism and the um, relationship to Jewish philosophy, to the Jewish soul, to Kabbalah, and I was wondering where I could go, what I could read to get more information about that, because it was fascinating to me. Um, so... I will go back to sharing screen for a second. Okay. Because I think I actually have the suggested bibliography and uh, Matthew Bagel writes a lot on that topic. I, I, I don't have this article here, but if you Google Matthew Bagel, uh, he, his research is dedicated to American Jewish art. Uh, and he has an article uh, on, um, Jewish, uh, I think it's either Newman or Rothko that he talks about Kabbalah uh, for in their art. Um, so um, I can send it to you later, or and, and if anyone else is interested, but uh, it's uh, it's in Begel's uh, writing. Uh, That's great. Uh, now there is uh, the book by um, uh, the one that, that you have a picture on. Um, 
uh, Soltis uh, published a book on Jewish American painters in the 20th century, where you can find bibliography on uh, that aspect is that. The abstract expressionist section in Fixing the World book is very sketchy, uh, but uh, because uh, the premise of the book is the idea of tikkun olam and how Jewish artists are um, kind of directly and indirectly uh, practicing tikkun olam through their art, be it social art or abstract art, you can find reference to that as well. That's um, great, thank you so much. We've got a hand raised. I can see Adele's hand is physically raised. Yeah, it's <laughs> mine. It's mine. It's me. So, Katarina, um, my only question is, as I was hearing all of this, and you were discussing the um, two men versus the two women, and I'm listening to the time, and I'm hearing what was most fascinating for me was your analysis of your time coming into this country. And I'm thinking of the women you were talking about um, and going back there and being really a period of time when the way two women you were talking about came from pretty affluent backgrounds yeah. and that today there's so many um, those artists who you find because of what happened after the 60s and the 70s I'd be curious how many they might group, because those who became before, if they were Jewish, there was so much assimilation going on by families, and those who were religious would probably be more like the books where the subject, when we see it as a, a Jewish subject, but for artists, um, even on a personal note, my mom, who was very, came from a very orthodox family, um, when she went, she went to University of the Arts in 37, in 1937, and it was a rabbi who had to get my grandfather's permission in order for her to even go to art school. So I, it, it seems that that might be another take that might become part of a conversation because I think it would, it was, um, there's a, a minor issue of, of how Jewish women and they assimilated and the old world, which wasn't so Jewish, it's Italian, it's everybody versus your generation. Right. Um, so the history of Jewish education in art, um, if we'll, I mean, it's a, it's a really much longer issue uh, and history, but um, the uh, perception of practical versus not practical is extremely strong in Jewish background due to the history. I'm talking about uh, European, East European background, but I'm pretty sure it was in the West too. Uh, so when you decide, when you send your son to college or to university and you're paying for that education, uh, the practicality of this, it was investment. The whole family invested in that. So to send someone to study art where it was no really kind of future for that person to make a living, it just couldn't happen basically. So artists who become, um, Jewish artists in Russia who become artists, they run away from their families basically. They very rarely you have approval of the patriarch to, to do that. Now, when you get to girls, I mean, forget it. It's complete waste of money, right? You're going, like we, we know the stories. <laughs> Um, so when they moved to America, there was a possibility for girls to learn like art student league, but really to become um, like artists full time and make a living for women, for reasons we all know as the history of women, for Jewish women, it was even more complicated. It, 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 they had to overcome additional uh, hurdles, additional um, uh, things that prevented them from doing that. Now in the post-war, uh, which would be a topic of another study, uh, it, it changed, just as it's changed in general for women, but for Jewish women, it probably changed even more because with the accessibility for education and like you, you don't really have to get permission of your father to go to school anymore, uh, that, that changed uh, enormously. And we know that uh, Jews embraced uh, you know, civil rights movement and uh, dif different social uh, rights uh, movement as, as disproportionately uh, at large. So like the whole second floor of the museum talks about it. 
Um, same with artists. Uh, there are so many Jewish women artists now. Now, I, I'm not an expert. I just don't know to what degree they uh, practice their Judaism or how they identify Jewishly or not. But I have a feeling, and maybe I'm judging by my community, is that uh, in our days, uh, religion is no longer identifier of uh, your belonging to, uh, uh, so you can be Jewish and not religious. That happens with the Russian speaking right. Jews left and right. Uh, and if you cannot deny these people their Jewishness just because they, they are not religious Jews. They will not let you. I mean, you can deny, but they still consider themselves Jewish and they invent and reinvent uh, being Jewish all the time. I think the same thing will happen to, uh, happens in the art world. It's, it's kind of, if person identifies uh, Jewishly, that makes them Jewish artists. If they don't, that's where we get into complicated issue because uh, as one Russian expression goes, when you are beaten up, you, they don't beat you, they don't beat your passport, they beat you. Meaning that in passports, people were identified as Jewish. So you can't say mm -hmm. that you're not Jewish, but if you're known as Jewish, that makes you Jewish. Right. I, I, it's a question if it's uh, so in America, um, if you can not be Jewish uh, and people still consider you Jewish. Thank you. I'm a little aware of time, so I wanted to wrap things up and thank Katarina so much for sharing this lecture with everyone. And thank her. Before we end, I do want to quickly um, put in a plug for future programs. So please check out our website. We have other ongoing events. We have another Art at Noon next week on collaborations between art and medicine with another one of our colleagues, Monica Zimmerman. We also have Papa Pours tomorrow and a coffee, Culture and Coffee with Brooke Davis Anderson, who I know is here on this call. So if you haven't already, please check out our website. And thank you, Katerina, again, and thank you to all of you for being here with us. It's great to see you all. Thank you. So, thank you. Take care and stay safe, everyone.